Okay, I believe we're going to get started with our second panel. And um, just a reminder to everyone, if, if you all received a program, please look in the back for the biographical sketches of each one of these panelists. Um, I know we've said it a, a number of times, but these panelists are all um, so esteemed. They're, so, they're such um, dignitaries uh, to Sand Creek, and, um, and they've done so much and have so much experience that our brief introduction doesn't do them justice. So please take a look at the biographical sketches uh, in the back of your program when you have a moment. So the second panel is called The Generations Since, Multi-Generational Impacts. The effects of the massacre endured today through immense multi-generational impacts on tribal traditions, society, identity, and livelihood. Panelists will share perspectives on these impacts based on personal experiences or knowledge of Sand Creek Massacre descendants. Our first speaker is Mr. Craig Moore. He's a park ranger and researcher, and that title, again, does not do him justice. <laughs> um, he's, he's, a, he's an incredible researcher um, with immense knowledge. And he will be, his presentation is, I'm sorry, As the Tall Tree Grows, A Cheyenne Legacy from Sand Creek. Craig? Thank you very much, Alexa. Thank you very much for attending. Again, my name is Greg Moore. I'm from San Francisco, Colorado. The story of another journey from San Creek and beyond. I call it As the Tall Tree Grows. Shivington, preacher, Masonic leader, abolitionist, colonel of the United States Volunteers, ordering and defending one of the bloodiest events in the history of Western America. How strange then. How little known, paradoxical and ironic. Another soon to be ordained Episcopal man of God on that death drenched field. As chaos spread across the valley, one young man making medicine would be among survivors. Later, not many years, this same young man became the owner of a red painted shield. A possession decorated with symbolic patterns and sacred colors. It had mystical power to change lives, to save lives, to weaken those who stood against it. The symbolism of making medicine shield coming from the story of its creation. It was seen during a dream and it passed from its maker, Red Bead, or Red Wolf, to Old Man Slow Runner and on to making medicine. Slow Runner was among those killed at the Sand Creek Massacre. Today, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of descendants of the massacre trace their lineage directly to this man, Slow Runner, from his son, Seven Bulls. Seven Bulls was one of the chiefs that survived Sand Creek. And then on down, to Seven Bulls' granddaughter, Doll Woman, from the late Mrs. Joe Yellow Eyes from Watonga, Oklahoma. <coughs> a sketch of the shield housed, I believe, at the Smithsonian was drawn about 1903 by William Fletcher, a Cheyenne, in the middle of a black circle, said to represent a sacred butte located in the Black Hills of South Dakota, a place where ceremonies come from place full of prayer, power, faith, and renewal. Mounted away from the circle, a kingfisher and a burrowing owl. Adaptability, endurance, and survival. Making medicine, an initiate, a devotee, his brotherhood, known as the Bowstring Society. He became a headsman, or leader. His headdress, adorned with yellow-dyed porcupine quills, the society's lance emblazoned with crow and hawk feathers. A sun dancer, that's his name, making medicine. A vow, carried forth and completed. Prayer, fasting, rejuvenation for a better world, a world of renewed hope and faith. Two men, Shivington and making medicine, so different. 
yet both fervent in their mission, practitioners of ancient prophecies. Like Shivington's Bethlehem, making medicine at places of the holy, shrines at the heart of life, the greatest Nakawus, or Bear Butte in the Black Hills. How strange then, surreal, troubling. They might be only miles or even yards apart on that grassy field of Sand Creek, quick to kill one another, given half the chance. Arrested in 1875 and sent along with other Plains Indians to a prison in Florida, Castillo de San Marcos, or simply Fort Marion. Charged by the U.S. Army with multiple crimes, or simply chose to meet quotas by a drunken lieutenant colonel. They were, according to General Phil Sheridan, unmitigated murderers of men, women, and children without a single particle of provocation. Twelve years after Sand Creek, staring across the endless expanse of the Atlantic Ocean, 1,500 miles from the Buffalo Plains of his home, chained, subjugated, and weak, his waist-length braids now shorn. But let me tell you, as his great-great-granddaughter said to me, the ways of Mahil, God, they burned bright in my great-great-grandfather's heart, allowing him to have spiritual healing, love, forgiveness, and hope. Imprisoned at Fort Mary, Florida, the jailer, a man named Captain Richard Pratt, himself a proponent of Indian assimilation, a movement influenced and strengthened by outcries over the inhumanity of the massacre at Sand Creek. Pratt once said, I believe in immersing the Indians in our civilization, and when we get them under, holding them there till they are thoroughly soaked. Pratt saw his work in part as a religious calling, transformation of his prisoners, a form of conversion. Making medicine adopted well to Pratt's discipline. Many others remained doubtful, perplexed, and distraught. Suicide, lives and cultures ruined and changed forever. While at Fort Marion, several of the younger men, Howlin' Wolf, Squint Eyes, Bear's Heart, Chief Killer, and Macon Medicine, were encouraged to draw pictures. They sold these to tourists for income. Today, housed in America's most prestigious galleries and museums, Macon Medicine's originals are considered nearly priceless. Macon Medicine's transformation was grounded in a strong belief in a higher power, the spirit world that was to him apparently one and the same, not red, not white, but both, a savior of all men. His name Pendleton came from an Ohio senator's family who helped sponsor Macon Medicine's endeavors after his release from prison. He was now known as David Pendleton. George Pendleton, his namesake, McClellan's vice presidential running mate during the 1864 election against Lincoln, and Mrs. Alice Pendleton, daughter of Francis Scott Key. They were enamored with this young man, making medicine, or David Pendleton. They befriended him during vacations to St. Augustine, purchased his artwork, and spoke to him of religious, social, and civic affairs. Pendleton let go of his sacred shield he replaced it with another sacred object, an object for him also of power, fortitude, and courage, possessing power to change lives, to save lives, to weaken those who stood against it, a shield called the Bible. Upon release from prison, making medicine, went to St. Paul's Church in Paris, New York, a long way from Sand Creek. Here his life is changed by the loving heart of Deaconess Mary Burnham, the two would remain steadfast friends and cohorts until Burnham's passing in 1904. While in New York, Macon Medicine or David Pendleton was immersed in training, baptized, and later confirmed. The same man, a dozen years earlier, fleeing up the banks of Sand Creek, made bloody and gory by the wounds, suffering, and death of his family. Many Cheyenne researchers and tribal genealogists today maintained Pendleton's father, Sleepin' Wolf, as well as Sleepin' Wolf's brother, Pendleton's uncle, Wolf Nose, or Red Shield, may have been killed at Sand Creek. However, we know from 
Official records, Pendleton's mother survived the carnage and was baptized by her son at the Cheyenne Agency in Indian Territory in 1882. Pendleton, who had several wives during his life, had a son, Frank, who lived until 1975, and turned Frank and his wife, Jenny, a granddaughter of Black Kettle, were survived by two daughters, Theodora and Elizabeth Pendleton, all had many descendants. In addition, Pendleton's brothers, Little Medicine and Wolf Tongue, were likely at Sand Creek as well. Little Medicine lived until 1893, Wolf Tongue until 1929, his son, Elmer Wolf Tongue. David Pendleton was encouraged to maintain a journal, a chronicle of work, people, places, and events that shaped his world. Today, this journal, covered over five decades, beginning in the 1870s, sits in the basement of his great-great-granddaughter. It's worn and torn. It's fallen apart, but it's viewed as some a sacred shrine, a godly-inspired memorial of salvation, evolution, and inspiration, done in the face of overwhelming odds. It seems to be an extension of the man himself, Sand Creek, war, prison, change, adaptation, assimilation, rebirth, and life. To paraphrase the words of his descendants, Grandpa saw in the new way this new road, some of the old. To him, as scared, forlorn, and as homesick as he must have been, it was this familiarity between what he was taught as a youth and young man and which, that which he saw and learned later that eased his burden. He saw in the Christian altar, the altar of the ancient Cheyenne. It hearkened to him the likeness of the universe, one creator, God, Mahil for everyone, and the power of sacrifice, no matter where, when, or how. It gave to him grace, it freed him, it comforted him, it made him a man. On Tuesday morning in 1881 at Grace Church in New York, David Pendleton was admitted to the Order of Episcopal Deacons. Soon he returned home to Indian Territory, recruiting several dozen Cheyenne and Arapaho to turn east with him. The first of over 230 Cheyenne and Arapaho who would eventually attend Carlisle Indian Industrial School in Pennsylvania. Subsequently, Pendleton returned to the plains of western Oklahoma, where he would establish and operate missions at Darlington, Bridgeport, and Whirlwind near Fay. Quote from a David Wicks, who was the Episcopal Reverend for the Missionary District of Indian Territory. When I reached the place at the appointed hour, we found some 50 young men and a few older ones assembled. These young men were the very ones whom David had led in war only seven years ago. Right below us, a few hundred yards, the medicine dance was going on. Hundreds thronged on every side. David seated him in a circle. He addressed them. Men, you all remember me and know me. You're my relations. When I led you out to war, I went first, and everything I told you was true. Now I have been away to the east and have come back and learned about another captain. He goes first, and all he tells me is true. I come back to you, my people, to tell you to go with me now, down this new road. In this sterile story, there's irony. A man bearing the scars of war, Sand Creek, Adobe Walls, Washita. A man bearing the scars of ceremonial sacrifice. Holes in his skin, a testament to prayers and fasting and suffering for a better world. A world of renewed hope and faith. The same man later, later wearing vestments, but still praying, still envisioning a better world, a world of renewed hope and faith. And so began Pendleton's work, endeavors that would continue for 50 years, seizing only in the flesh with his death in 1931. His legacy of peace and love and fellowship and forgiveness, however, continues at the Pendleton Episcopal Center in Watonga, Oklahoma. Pendleton's memory, his recollections, trauma, his feelings of Sand Creek, who knows? Only this we can be certain. Pendleton didn't wallow in victimization. He overcame, he triumphed, and he forgave. His heart not bitter, his soul not spiteful. I'd like to read an excerpt from a letter Pendleton wrote to a church deacon. Quote, I am an Indian, but my eyes have been opened. I have been washed in the water. 
I have eaten the bread and drunk the wine. I will grow up in his knowledge as a tall tree grows. Up and up and up. In 1985, at the closing hour of the 68th Episcopal General Convention, 121 years after the massacre at Sand Creek Macon Medicine, posthumously achieved sainthood. His first Saints Day celebrated September 1st, 1986, right here in Washington, D.C. at the National Cathedral, a long way from Sand Creek. St. David Pendleton, like countless survivors of the war, has faced a new world. His life, a legacy of iron, full of irony. His influence, especially among other early day Plains Indian Christians, is both legendary and permanent. However, his conversion in faith remains questioned by some. Even admonished by others, including traditional Cheyenne and Arapaho ceremonial men. His mission work at Whirlwind, not always fully supported nor adequately funded, his acceptance by state and country constrained by laws of citizenship, voting rights, and land ownership. His grandson, a Marine veteran, abused and beaten to death at the hands of a nation for which St. Pendleton preached and prayed. But ever respectful, ever humble, St. Pendleton's discipline hard-earned on the war path and at the cross and altar allowed him to go forward, to overcome and to grow, to grow as the tall tree grows, up and up and up. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moore.